Hey, uh, I might repeat our names as well. <laughs> so I'm Michael Beverland. that's work with uh, Gorian Aligic, Jung Wan Ha, Gretchen Campbell, Anna Maria Ray, and, and Alexei Gorshkov. And this is um, a little bit of a different flavor of a talk from uh, what's usually here at QIP, because it's actually a proposal for an experimental system. Um, can I just check, can people hear me everywhere? Yeah, great. OK, so uh, first I'm going to describe what I mean by a, a small quantum computer, which differs from a, a general quantum computer that, that we all would love to, to build and have. Then I'm going to describe uh, a, the task of spectrum estimation. And then I'm going to go into a particular method that spectrum estimation can be, can be solved using uh, the Young diagram measurement approach. And then I'm going uh, to describe how that can be implemented with uh, a full real quantum computer, if you had one. Um, and I'll also describe how it can be implemented with uh, what I will describe as a small quantum computer, which is really the physical system that um, I'm going to describe to you. And uh, then I'll summarize. OK. So a fully functioning quantum computer is something that should be scalable. We should be able to build it as large as we want so that we can implement a, a big circuit. Um, it should be fault tolerant so that the, the underlying physical system that we use to make the computer um, when it has errors in the system um, don't affect the, the quantum computer and cause the computation to be useless. And it should be uh, universal in the sense that any arbitrary circuit can be implemented on the, on the computer. On the other hand, small quantum computers don't have to satisfy any of these properties. Um, we relax them all. So maybe, they, maybe it's some physical system which doesn't necessarily scale up. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be fault tolerant. And it could still be useful for our purposes if, if it satisfies, if it achieves some individual goal. Maybe you can't use this to perform some arbitrary computation. But if there's some specific task that it can achieve, then that could still be useful. And uh, why make all of these relaxations? Well, really, because we don't have the top version yet. So these, uh, at least some small quantum computers in this sense, should be possible to build with current technology. And that's exciting in itself. And maybe we will learn from that process. Um, OK, so I, I'll talk about the special purpose task of spectrum estimation now. So the scenario of spectrum estimation is you have some, um, you're handed some unknown density matrix row. You, you are given many copies of this density matrix row. And for whatever reason, you would like to know the eigenspectrum. So the, the, these values of p here, when you diagonalize the, the density matrix. Um, and that is the problem, learn the, the spectrum. And in order to do this, you should receive many copies, say n copies of the, the state. And you should be allowed to perform some measurements on the system. So the measurements that you uh, can perform should be described by as a POVM. And you, so the, the actual strategy that you, would, um, that you would carry out would be specified by a set of POVM elements. Um, and these elements can be very general. So here I'm, I'm saying that they can act on the full space of all n qubit systems where the, the states live. Um, and the second part of the, of the uh, method should describe how you uh, map from a particular measurement outcome. Let's suppose you, you find, after your measurement, this particular POVM. How do you map that to your estimate of the spectrum? Um, and that is what I describe as Q here. And for a, a strategy to be good, then it should be the case that the probability of finding a particular estimate spectrum Q should be th such that Q is close to the true spectrum P should be uh, concentrated. So it should be the probability should be high that you, you predict a value close to the true spectrum. OK, so uh, now for a method of how to achieve this Young Diagram Spectrum Estimation. Before we go into the, to the details, I'd like to motivate um, the, this particular method by discussing uh, some symmetries of the problem of spectrum estimation. So suppose that we ha already have some strategy 
uh, specified by this set of uh, POVM elements here. Then we know that for any density matrix rho, um, the spectrum is the same as the spectrum would be for the, the same density matrix rho, but rotated into some other basis. So the spectrum is invariant under basis change. So using this fact, we know that if we were to rotate the, the basis of, so if we were to change basis for all of the copies of the state that we were given, then the, the problem would be, the, the measurement outcomes would be uh, the same. And you, this is a, essentially equivalent to taking the original POVM and applying uh, a basis change simultaneously to, to all n sites. And you will achieve a new POVM and the new POVM has to have exactly the same probability distributions of outcomes as the original, so it has to, to be equally good. Okay. So similarly, the, the state of n copies of rho is invariant under the permutation of any individual one of the, of the um, sites. So you can take rho from here and swap it with rho over here and the state still looks the same. So there's an invariance of the state under any permutation of sites. You can, um, you can see that this is the, the probability uh, outcome of a particular uh, POVM element, and it's invariant under applying this arbitrary permutation sigma here. So you see that, uh, it, similarly to above, if you actually permute all of the POVM, if you apply this permutation on the sites to all of the POVM elements, then you will again get another um, strategy than the one you start, a different strategy in, in general from the one you started with, but which is equally good. And combining these two things together, you can see that you can apply any, any element of the group built up from all of the permutations and all of these uh, basis changes. And that, that group is NS, SN cross SUD. Um, and yes, when you apply a group element to the POVM, you'll get a new POVM, which is equally good. Great. OK, so, so now it's a Young diagram spectrum estimation. So this strategy was uh, kind of made famous by Kyle and Werner, although Aliki and Anno had uh, another previous result with essentially the, the same ideas. Um, and I think it was done independently, I should say. Um, the, so this strategy actually itself um, respects the symmetries that we just talked about. So if you apply one of these um, elements of this, this group, this, um, the basis change or permutation or some combination, instead of getting a new strategy with the same properties, you actually get the same strategy back. So this particular measurement basis uh, that you see in Young diagram um, spectrum estimation is, is a very natural one. And so you can kind of quickly argue that um, these projectors have to be projectors onto representations of the, of the group, since the group preserves the, the space that they project onto. And um, moreover, they, they should be irreducible representations of the group. Um, so irreducible representations of, of the group SN cross SUD can be labeled one to one by the set of Young diagrams where there are n boxes split into at most d rows, and the rows should be non-increasing in, in length. Um, and it turns out that this set of operators that we should measure, so this POVM, is optimal for the task of spectrum estimation. But I sit, still haven't uh, explained how we go. For, so the, I've, I've told you the first part of the, the <coughs> algorithm, which is um, what basis to measure in, but I haven't told you from the measurement outcomes how to infer the spectrum. But the, the set of measurements that you should perform is, is optimal. <coughs> okay, so to understand a little bit more about the latter part, um, the space of n qubits uh, actually contains precisely one irrep um, of, of Sn cross Sud. So for example, if you have five q trits, then th th these, this is all the ways of writing a valid Young diagram um, using five boxes and three at most three rows. Um, and the, the feature of 
the, the feature of the problem that is useful for spectrum estimation is essentially that um, when you apply this measurement to the state of n copies of rho, then the, the actual probability distribution is concentrated around the particular Young diagram, which when, or Young diagrams, which when normalized, um, give the probability distribution back. Okay, that's a bit of a mouthful, but I'll hope to give you an example to show what I mean. So if, for example, the, the state that we don't know, but if it happened to be written in this way, so the eigenvalues that we care about are 0 0.7, 0 0.2, and 0 0.1. If we were to, to implement this uh, measurement in, in this case with uh, 30 copies of the state, then an outcome would be a Young diagram, which would look something like this. There are 30 boxes here. And the point is that when you, when you normalize this, the, the lengths of the rows are going to be roughly equal to the to the um, spectrum that we're actually looking for. That's what, that's what I was saying above, essentially. Um, of course, there'll be some distribution. And so you can kind of hopefully see what I mean by this, this picture. The, there'll be a distribution of the row lengths, which will kind of be center close to, to the actual spectrum. And then if you, imp if you do the same thing, but with more um, copies, then the, the distribution will narrow and of course, you know, you can keep going and get a more and more focused uh, <coughs> estimate. OK, so essentially what this is telling us is that we should make, so the Young diagram um, spectrum estimation algorithm should be to, to measure in the, um, in the IREP basis and then to use whatever Young diagram we get, normalize it, and use that as our estimate of the spectrum. Okay. So this is actually the, the same measurements that were analyzed in the, the great merge talk by um, John Wright and Zhong Wen Ha. Um, and that they talked about full tomography as well, but this should be kind of, they, they would probably call it weak sure sampling, um, is the first part of their, um, their, the algorithms that they were analyzing. Um, but a, it kind of begs a question. I mean, I said I was going to talk about um, some experimental uh, thing, something in the real world. So these are, in fact, highly entangled measurements that, um, that these, this Young diagram measurement um, requires. And they're, they're also very non-local. Are these really physical? So moving on to that, they, in some sense they are, because first of all, if you had a quantum computer, you could use that to, to do it. And we believe, hopefully, we can build quantum computers. Uh, I'll describe how that works in a second. Um, but I'll also show that it, you don't even need a, a quantum computer to, to do this if you have a system with special properties. OK, so if you were to use a quantum computer, you would start with, um, uh, so this should be like a QDIT quantum computer, where your inputs are the n copies of the, the state row, and the actual circuit that would be implemented on your, on your quantum computer would be the, the Schur transform, actually it's inverse. And the, the point is it maps the, the basis that we want to measure in this IREP basis, or, which stands for irreducible representations, by the way, um, to the, the product uh, basis, the computational basis. And once um, we've mapped to the computational basis, then we just need to measure locally. Um, so this should be possible by the assumptions of our quantum computer. And the, the circuit is, in fact, uh, it's an efficient circuit to, to implement on a quantum computer. Um, the drawback, of course, is that you need a quantum computer. <laughs> so now I want to give some intuition as to how you could do this with um, a physical system with particular properties. So the aim would be to engineer a Hamiltonian, which actually has the the symmetry that, that we mentioned before, this full SN cross SUD symmetry. And in that case, um, it, it must be that that Hamiltonian can be written uh, in the IREP basis. It'll be diagonal in the IREP basis. So these are the same projectors that we talked about before. And this, this is or would be very useful because um, if you ha have the, these 
additional um, capabilities, then you can infer the spectrum P of the density matrix rho. So you would need essentially to be able to prepare the system in the state rho. So every, every uh, part of the system should be in state rho. You should be able to measure the energy. And provided that the energy is, um, so this, the energy as a function of IREP, provided that is an invertible function, then you should be able to, to infer um, the spectrum. So to give an indication of how, how this works, um, if you imagine uh, the expectation value of the energy in the state rho to the n, that's just this object here, the trace of rho to the n times the Hamiltonian. But as we wrote above, you can rewrite the Hamiltonian in the IREP basis. So it will become this object here. This is the probability of a particular IREP given the state rho to the n. But this is what we already discussed when we talked about uh, Young diagram, um, the Young diagram measurement. We know that this is tightly peaked, as I showed you with figures. With figures, this is tightly peaked around um, the particular value or values of uh, lambda, such that when you normalize them, they look like the spectrum. So essentially, the expectation value of the energy should uh, approach um, the energy of a particular lambda, which is lambda that is close to NP. And then we can just invert this to infer lambda. And, and we're done at that stage. OK, so uh, I'd like to describe to you now the, uh, such a Hamiltonian, a Hamiltonian with SN cross SUD symmetry. Um, so the, the Hamiltonian, this is just a, a constant here. And this is a sum over all sites, J and K, that run from 1 to N. And the, the sites themselves, these are just, it's just, again, the space of uh, n qubits. And this object here is the only operator in the, in the Hamiltonian, and it's just a swap operator. So just as a, as a simple demonstration, if you had the swap of site 1 and 3, then it would replace, it would swap i1 by i3 here and uh, give you this output. It's a very simple operator. This whole Hamiltonian you can describe as uh, an all-to-all -all swap ha Hamiltonian because every single site um, has the same strength of interaction with every other site. Um, and it's all swaps. So the all-to-all -all feature tells us that there should be SN permutation symmetry of the Hamiltonian because if we were to permute the, the sites, the Hamiltonian would look precisely the same. And the swap Hamiltonian, it, it is the same if you uh, make spin rotations. So that's why this exhibits SN cross SUD symmetry. And how does this arise in, in nature? How could we actually construct this? If you consider a one-dimensional square trap, like the, the kind that you might have seen in first year quantum me mechanics class, um, and you place the atoms in, in the trap, You'll need n atoms if you want to have uh, n site Hamiltonian. Then the Hamiltonian, this Hamiltonian, actually will arise under certain conditions as the interaction Hamiltonian between the, the atoms. And the, the sites of the Hamiltonian will actually correspond to the spatial modes of, of uh, the atoms. So that's the sites, but the, the levels, so the levels from 1 to d, they correspond to the nuclear spin degrees of freedom of the atoms. Okay. <coughs> and for an atom, a uh, particular atomic species with, um, with nuclear spin i, then this is the, the number of levels that you will obtain. Great. So as mentioned before, the, the physical system requirements for this particular, uh, or sorry, I guess I didn't actually mention this in my title. But the, the physical um, system requirements are also include the, the following thing. So we need a particular species of atom. It's very important. I'll explain briefly why in a second. Um, and as I said before, the trap should be this perfect square trap, or at least something approximately square. Um, so th in this case, we, we get the Hamiltonian that we want, this uh, Hamiltonian with SN cross SUD symmetry. If you break these requirements, just to give an illustration, if you use a different species of atom, so non-alkaline earth atoms, 
then um, unfortunately you will end up with, um, instead of an, an SUD symmetric term in the Hamiltonian, you, you actually get something which mixes the spin states, so it won't exhibit the full symmetry we need. Um, alternatively, if you have a harmonic well rather than a square well, then you result in the SN symmetry being broken. So these are really key requirements to use this species of this kind of atom and uh, this kind of trap. And, and I should mention that um, most experiments with trapped atoms are uh, using wells which are, are harmonic. Um, people, there have been a few, a, f a very small number of experiments with square wells, um, but that's kind of the main thing that needs to be done differently in, in labs to implement this kind of experiment. But it should be possible and people are working on it. Um, okay, so physical system requirements continued. Something else that I kind of swept under the rug in the previous slide is that um, we actually, there's another degree of freedom of the atoms, and that's the electronic uh, spins. So as you, you hopefully remember, the sites correspond to the spatial degrees of freedom, the levels correspond to the nuclear spin degrees of freedom, and there's an additional degree of freedom, which is the electronic uh, state. But we assume that the electronic state in this Hamiltonian is, is always fixed to be the, the lowest energy one. And uh, generally, that's, that's a fair assumption because there's quite a large energy separating the, the two levels, the, the lowest energy electronic states and the highest, or the, the first excited. Um, but if we were to include it in our analysis, then um, we would have to increase the Hilbert space from that of n qubits to n qubits times qubits. Uh, because we have this extra 